the roller coaster of life and work for startups. So we have uh, five panelists with us, and uh, we know, you know, the startups are very progressive, and uh, they have opened a massive job opportunity, and there's no hierarchy also. But there's one thing, uh, you know, uh, one point which struck is, you know, they don't have a good work-life balance. So uh, this, uh, this session is all about that. First of all, I want to know why is so, you know, why the startups have got a bad press for, you know, uh, not a good life, work-life balance. So, yeah. Hello? So, uh, as a startup eco-culture, uh, you have, like, tremendous, you know, expectation uh, from the customer because it's battle of existence. And as a startup, you have to, you know, stand out in the market because you need to, uh, you know, establish yourself and, you know, maintain that, uh, existence in the market. So, as a startup, you have to be uh, very proactive and no, uh, fight for existence. So that way, startup itself is a high performance culture. It's promoting high performance culture, and that way, employee also need to be you know uh, performing high. And in in that pressure only, they will have to be available all the time. Uh, you can say uh, the life is like after working hours, they will have to you know uh, give some output on holidays, on weekly offs. So it's all about, uh, you know, battle of existence. And that way, with startup, their employees also has to be, you know, work hard for, you know, uh, meeting demands. Yeah. You guys agree? <laughs> so, you want to move it? So, so essentially what happens is the rate of complexity that goes up in a startup versus the rate of talent density that goes in a startup don't match. So what lands up happening is what large companies do is they cover this gap with process. And in the startup, what you don't have is process, right? So a lot of it is just brute force and passion that pulls it through till you're big enough where you need a process, right? Uh, so effectively, you can't expect fast growth uh, and also have work-life balance, also have good compensation, also not have hierarchy. So you can't have the cake and eat it too. Uh, I think it's more a trade-off. Uh, smart people know what they're signing up for. Uh, and I've also seen, I was uh, telling the panel before <coughs> backstage, where someone in, uh, in, in a startup uh, quit. And, and we asked, why did you quit? And, and he said that pehle kammi mein problem hota tha, to do baje bhi sab call mein aajate the. And we used to solve it there and then. Abhi das baje bhi problem aata, we say abhi kal dekhenge. If I have to join a process I would join a Unilever, right? Uh, why would I join a startup? I joined for the hustle. So I think it's a, it's a double-edged sport. Uh, I think if it works for you, it works for you. And, and as such, I just think work-life balance is a problem to be solved by an individual uh, than a company, uh, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so I think just, I think Karthik articulated it very eloquently, but just to add, I think there is in a startup by design, there's a lot of ambiguity and chaos, right? And people sign up for it. Entrepreneurs are extremely passionate people, right? There is hustle, there is there's a lot of passion, right? And what un unconsciously happens is this long hours that happens. And I think all of us on stage and here are guilty of plowing through, through long 16, 18 hour for, for weeks on end, right? So I think that's where, and resources are finite. Funding, money is finite. Like Karthik said, there are no processes. Uh, there, there are not enough people to do stuff. So there's probably somebody, someone who's doing the job of five people, right? So all of that adds to uh, the complexity and the hustle, and all of it adds to the, the stress or, or the burnout that can happen. And obviously, the, the success rates of startups, right? I think 90% of startups fail, right? 10% of startups fail in the first one year. And I read this interesting stat somewhere that 5% of the startups fail because of the burnout that founders experience, right? So all of these aspects kind of, the amalgamation of all of this kind of leads to what we see in some of the startups today. But everybody is not used to the hustle culture. So, you know, how do you uh, try to, uh, you know, balance that thing, you know, for the employees? Any strategies you guys employ or you think should be deployed? Well, I'd love to hear about strategies to solve that. But uh, the point is, like Karthik mentioned, um, I think the, the first part is that people sign up for a startup knowing there is hustle. People sign up because they want to work and grow faster. 
And there's this, whether that's true or not, uh, startups have created this, this, uh, this aura that you grow faster if you work closer to the business. So I've, I worked before in city. So people used to leave city and join a startup because they felt that they'll, they'll grow faster there. They're closer to the business. They saw business problems and do that. But the problem is if you don't embed a culture of, of positive pressure, right? So if you, I mean, pressure is like reality. But if you don't bring in something like positive pressure, which means that the way that you're working is going to impact or the, what you're working on is going to impact either the end customer, the stakeholders, the board, the company, etc. Once you bring in that, there's a purpose. Once you bring in purpose, I think the, the, the pressure that you're talking about literally goes off, right? At least in the mind of people. And I think that's the, that's the big point there. You bring in purpose, you talk about impact, you talk about the reason why you exist, and the reason why the company exists, and why each employee or each team member is a part of it, then it becomes a lot more easier. That's my view. Yeah, I think uh, it depends on the stage of the startup. But in general, startups work in a very uncertain uh, situations. So to make the uncertainty happen, there has to be a hustle. And when you are hiring, it's important who you're hiring. So when Columbus was about to set out sail to discovering US, he put this hiring bo uh, board, right? So he needed people to actually sail with him. He said, I may or may not deliver any goal to you, but I will promise an adventure, right? So only those seeking such an adventure have actually joined him, and they would never complain that they have actually, you know, join, uh, joined for something that they might die, right? So these guys were seeking adventure. I think early stage, it's important that you hire only those guys. If you're hiring only for the sake of giving out money, make sure these are not crucial, critical roles. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, more important. and. Uh, Late stage companies, the founders, they're one level down leadership, and then maybe two level down. If these guys are driven, I think that is enough. Rest of them can actually have reasonable work-life balance. But if those are also passionate and working hard, they will see uh, growth growing very fast. So uh, I think it really boils down to the people, uh, their aspirations aligning with the startup, at uh, various stages. Can I just add something? I, I think it, unfortunately, unfortunately, somehow it has just become that Raja Praja culture in the sense our engagement surveys, our glint surveys are designed. Oh, are you happy? Are you recognized? Are you motivated? Uh, I think what we have done is at least we have flipped it around. Uh, and we said, did you do enough to stay engaged at work today? Did you do enough to talk to five new people in the company? Uh, right? I think a lot of times what lands up happening is there are certain influencers who land up creating something what I call is an illusion of majority. Yeah. So if I'm an influencer and I can come and say, hey, work-life balance problem hai, because I'm an influencer, everybody starts believing sabke sab work-life balance problem. Uh, so I think fundamentally a lot of it is to be, so, like just fundamentally, right? So ask someone, why, why, why were you late for a meeting? Oh, I got stuck in the other meeting. So you're saying the chair held your leg and said, don't go. No, you chose to stay in the other meeting. I think a lot of times, most people just make dis dim disempowering choices. I was stuck in traffic. No, you started late. I can't get up in the morning. No, you can't sleep on time. So what has happened is work-life balance also has somehow become a problem for one side to solve, which I effectively feel is such a disempowering way of solving it because you're saying the employee is helpless and now company has to do something. Uh, I just somehow feel we need to just change the narrative of the question itself and say, did you do enough to have work-life balance? Did you say no where the meeting was not important? Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, I think it's not, uh, it's, it's not autocracy happening. Uh, so Pat, do you have any? No, I think, uh, I think a lot of things, right? One is obviously walk the walk and talk the talk, right? If leaders are being mindful, taking breaks, they have to, right? Uh, and, and lead by example, right? And have very clear boundaries set up. That will automatically cascade to their teams, right? And then obviously do periodic check-ins, you have conversations about how they're feeling, what they're doing, right? But, but to Karthik's point, I think the onus is on, also on the employee, right? To make sure that he or she is setting those guardrails, setting those boundaries for themselves, right? Because what walk, 
work life balances is different for different people right and they need to understand and that stems from purpose that ganesh talked about right and and kind of we often talk about something called we don't talk about work life balance we talk about something called work life integration right uh, because the kind of jobs that we are at a lot of these a lot of the organizations that we work with have our global roles right you got to be available across time zones so you got to kind of evolve that that time that works for you in a way that is not leading to stress or chronic stress or burnout or whatever whatever that might be right so i think it's 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 all of us coming together leaders companies culture the employees themselves taking accountability and responsibility for making sure that they're not getting burnt out and uh, and they are excited about what they're doing day in and day out uh, we just heard you know uh, that you should recruit uh, for the startup means people who are ready for it you know but if some you have uh, recruited somebody who is not ready uh, for this culture how do you ensure you know that he doesn't leave he or she doesn't leave in the beginning itself yeah i can uh, speak for that so i think uh, when uh, someone joined right whether they liked it or not uh, if you were to retain them uh, there are two things that motivate people one is money the other one is uh, being connected and feeling belonged and that onus lies on the founders the initial hr people like you know startups do not have any hr right it's uh, the founders who actually play the role of a hr and that's a good thing because they get to work closely with the person and their personality their aspiration and their purpose if they are able to impart to this particular team uh, you would have absolutely fantastic uh, you know, retention even with those people who have not subscribed to a typical startup culture i have had that success reasonably well uh, and i believe you know the onus lies on founders their uh, storytelling ability and uh, you know making them connected with the environment no it's very heartening to see a founder talk about it right i mean it's 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 very nice uh, because you know um, when a person joins an early stage startup the the responsibility of making him her or them actually successful lies with the with the person who actually recruited them that that goes for other companies as well but more so for a early stage startup sometimes we call them early believers right so you literally are risking your life you don't know if your next month salary is going to come and the person's actually joined you so when you start at the top and then you create that culture uh, of being i mean showing the person the way how the 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 day in day out work needs to operate and that comes from a founder then that's very inspiring so i think that's that's great that vijay has actually brought that up and that's where the responsibility of the founder actually comes in okay let me be the devil's advocate <laughs> uh, one i think if it doesn't work for someone they should leave it's okay right things do, i'm i'm like have, has anyone seen tesla's employee handbook tesla's employee handbook says anti employee handbook it says this culture is not for everyone it's okay i'm like nobody is wrong this culture doesn't work uh, and one uh, i think people should do enough research it's not just employers who need to do ref checks i think it's also important employees do ref checks here why did the earlier person leave Uh, what's the history of this position how many people have left this job in last 5 years right what has the company done right uh, maybe speaking to some ex employees maybe speaking to some current employees so i think it's just about a rigor one do your research before you take something up if you join of course founder plays a great the storytelling is is very important for people to stay right if you're smart you'll quit uh, you love it is why you go through the pain right so effectively i think one of course if you believe the story is going to compel this person to go through this uh, otherwise just just the most kindest thing you can tell someone is this is not working out i think the definition of kindness is not just being nice at times just saying the most important thing that the person maybe needs to hear and is not nice to hear all right so i think what we really need is more authenticity rather than molly coddling uh, i just feel will solve things faster no i was just i think just kind of adding to karthik's point which is essentially that i think the onus is also on organizations to very clearly and explicitly lay out their culture i think there's an organization called hubspot that has published a culture playbook which is available 
public preview. So any candidate, prospective candidate, is expected to go through it before they come for an interview. So there is, if an organization, whatever it might be, says, hey, there is going to be a lot of hustle, the candidates need to know it. And then they make a very conscious choice of whether they want to join the organization and be a part of it. Right? So I think uh, the, that's the way it works. And I think specifically on the point of, uh, we, we spoke about founders playing a very critical role. Uh, at Freshworks, we talk about what we call a tripod, right? Uh, which is three aspects. One is the learning and the growth that comes in the role. Second is uh, the growth, right? Your promotions and all that. And third is the monetary aspects of it, right? And even if one leg is longer or imbalanced, the tripod falls, right? So it has to, we have to make sure that all of it in a very balanced way grows so that the employee is happy and it's, very, it's a very sustainable way of building an organization. All right, and you also touched upon, uh, the panelists also touched upon the topic of processes not in place in the startup in the beginning. But can we, can we think about putting the processes in place? Like, uh, you know, uh, I understand uh, the culture is such and you're still building a startup, but some sort of processes that are already there in the corporates can be yeah, that's the that's the aspiration for sure. You don't you don't intend to work in a in a chaotic environment anyway. But I think the problem is uh, it's a fine line to tread between being a process driven bureaucratic company versus being a company where there's a lot of empowerment, there's a appetite to fail, right, uh, and innovate therefore. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very fine line to tread. So I mean, more processes you have, people become aware of those processes, therefore they tend to be more compliant. I, I'm not saying they shouldn't be, but they be, tend to be more compliant to the processes that you put, which makes you become less innovative. Uh, but of course, the reason why when we move to later stage, we try and bring professionals from say larger companies or people who have uh, who've run these processes is because of that itself, the intent or the aspiration is to become a good process-driven company because you obviously need to get better audited, you need to move towards becoming a listed company. So there's a lot of work towards that, which, which the processes actually take care of. That's, that's, that's again my answer. Okay, and lastly, I uh, want to talk, uh, want to ask, can outsourcing uh, help? No, I, I think uh, your first part, it's not the big which is eating the small, hmm. it's the fast which is eating the slow, right? You don't want a big car, you want a fast car, you want a big phone, you want a smartphone, right? So essentially, every time you want Zepto in 10 minutes, Uber in three minutes, pizza in 30 minutes, and then these startups are the ones who are delivering it. <laughs> so if you want instant gratification, it doesn't just come with process, right? There's a lot of chaos at the back end, right? And I'm sure outsourcing is, is possible, but would you want to put a one-month-old baby with a crutch, right? So timing of when you outsource something is also important, uh, right? So I think is is the baby big enough to understand uh, the the cons that come with outsourcing are important. Mm -hmm. I think it's far more. Um, uh, I, I think what what he said, what stage it is, right? Karthik at 18 wanted something very different from the company with Karthik at 22 and Karthik at 30 today wants something else from the company. So wo, her stage pe, what is important to me keeps changing, right? And, and hence outsourcing is a product of what is important. Now process is more important, speed is okay. So that's when you outsource. Yeah, see, I think a lot of organizations are trying to outsource the mundane repetitive tasks, right? That's where bots, automation, all of that comes into play, right? So the idea is to make sure employees are spending, I mean, you can't completely wipe it out, but to a large extent, spend time on things that are meaningful to them. And if you can kind of bring down the, the repetitive, mundane, administrative task for employees through technology, whatever it might be, I think that is going to play along. That's going to go a long way in helping employees stay more motivated, engaged, etc. Anybody wants to add? So yeah, I think outsourcing always helps because there are two types of outsourcing. When there is a, like internal incapability, you can always have some kind of experts, people, you know, uh, advising you or coming for some time and, you know, helping you to uh, fill the gap. So this is one kind, one kind of outsourcing which, you know, build confidence in your existing people. Uh, that can be a for short term, 
and also there are like many work which is uh, sort of non important uh, for that we can always outsource and you know uh, keep down the burden of existing people so that way outsourcing always help according to me uh, I think early stages, uh, it should be zero outsourcing because every function, uh, you would want to explore what is actually gives you the competitive advantage over a large company that actually probably already been outsourcing. Uh, I would say that seed, zero outsourcing, series A, zero outsourcing. Maybe when you crossed 400 employees trend, that's where you could actually think about outsourcing, like he said, Karthik said, non-core functions. But otherwise, uh, for startups to stay competitive, it is actually important that they specialize and uh, figure out their competitive advantage on any function, whether it is sales, customer success, uh, or development, or any of these core functions. Uh, it's important they figure out what is best for them.